John chapter 16, beginning in verse 25. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said to him, See now, you are speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this we believe that you came forth from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your word. There's no greater place we can turn to for life. Lord, you, you said that your words are spirit and they are truth. We know that they're life, Lord. We know that uh, you desire to shape us by your word, Lord. We recognize that you want us to have the right kind of heart into which you can plant seed, your word, so that a huge harvest and fruitfulness happens in and through our lives. So we yield our hearts today to you. Encourage your people today. Lift our heads. Help us to refocus on you. We thank you that we have a family here. We thank you that we're boldly showing love, Lord. And thank you that you're adding to the church those who are being saved. We commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we've come to the end of what's known as the upper room discourse. They probably had already left the upper room. We get inclination or indications of that earlier, but he's still part of the same overall conversation um, there. And so he's saying his last things he's going to say, he wants to say to his disciples before he's taken from them. And he's, pre he's been preparing them, as we've seen, for his departure. He's trying everything that is appropriate to help them understand what it is that's coming as best as, as they can receive. And so he's, he's trying to get across to them that I'm going away, but I'm, you are going to see me. We saw that last week, but things are going to get bad. Um, he's basically saying you're, you're going to have, you're going to need peace. You're going to need, need peace from me, but the world has no peace to offer. That's the wrong place to look for peace with God. You know, a lot of people are just completely searching for peace in this life. Because this, the world doesn't have any peace to offer. They have no capacity. The ways of this world has no capacity to give us peace. When you study the epistles, especially of Paul, you see that he greets them with grace and peace. And, and it's not by accident, by the Holy Spirit, that it's in that order, grace and peace. Because you can't experience the peace of God until you first experience the grace of God. That's not original. That's why it's good, uh, but it's so true, and he even adds mercy to the pastoral epistles, so they got us covered. We need mercy for sure, and so he, he, he knows it's going to get bad. He knows that it's, it's going to be hard, and it's, but it's not, if you look at from God's perspective, you see that nothing is out of control. Nothing is careening out of control. There's nothing that is... Um, you know, beyond, it's not a disaster. It's not a defeat. It, it, was, it was planned. The, the, the son was slain before the, before the foundation of the world. From eternity past, he knew he would come and die in our place. And so um, the worst thing could happen to them, their thinking would be him being taken away. But that's really not what's happening. That's not the worst thing. The worst thing is if they you know, allow the enemy to have his full intentions fulfilled in their lives. And, he's, and Jesus has been sowing truth into their lives to help them so that they wouldn't question, they, wouldn't, they would trust, they would have faith. And so 
Jesus, it, this was all about victory. Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave on our behalf, but he also al allows things into our lives to make us, as Christians, to make us more godly, to make us more usable for him. We have to understand that. And, and so he's trying to get them to see that, but we also, we're also told that in Colossians chapter 1, or Colossians chapter 2, rather, we're told that his victory was on the cross, and he made a public spectacle of the demonic realm triumphing over in it, in the sense of the cross. So he's trying everything to get this through to him. He's planting seeds that would no doubt later germinate as they're praying, as they're, as they're seeking God after all this is about to happen. And um, he, he said last week, we saw him say, a little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while you will see me. And we saw that the see there are two different words in the same verse. The first instance of the word see, it means to gaze. The second instance has to do with meditation or perception. And so he's saying, in a little while, you're not going to be able to gaze at me. But then in a little while, not much time, you, you're going to perceive, you're going to understand, you're going to see me raised from the dead. And they don't uh, even understand that. So right now they're saying, this, it's, we've seen the most amount of love we're probably ever going to see from him. But he, they haven't seen anything yet because the greatest demonstration of his love, while we're still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly, is going to be expressed. And so he, we're, we're going to see him kind of further prepare them for his departure just a few hours from this point. And then next week, Lord willing, we'll look at John chapter 17, where Jesus will put direct his face towards the Father, and he will pray for those disciples. So the teaching time is going to end, but the praying for them time is going to start. And he even mentions us, so the ones that will believe through you. You didn't realize you're in the Bible, did you? You're in the Bible, uh, and he prays for us. And then in an in a indirect kind of, um, we'll see it, you know, in a sense related to church unity, he prays that we would be one, and we can, in a sense, answer that prayer by cooperating with the Holy Spirit because, he, you know, Ephesians chapter 4 talks about that, you know, the, there's one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one God, and, and we have way more in common with those that believe differently than us that are believers than we ever do with uh, our differences. But the sad thing is, is that usually the names of churches are describing the differences instead of focusing on what we have in common. So he's going to say some dear, precious things. He's going to talk about peace, going to talk about him overcoming the world. And I want to focus on three points this morning. First, we have ultimate access to the Father. We see that in verse 26. Point number two, the reason for that access in verse 27. And then lastly, in verse 33, we have peace because Jesus overcame the world. So the title of my message this morning is, Jesus' victory over the world secures our peace. So let's begin looking verse by verse, starting in verse 25. These things I have spoken to you, figurative, or to you in figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. So he's not able to do that now in, in the full way that he wants to do that because they can't receive it. And in a moment, they're going to think that he started that. They're going to say, we understand you. But that's really, I don't believe what he has in mind. I believe he's talking about subsequent to the resurrection. But they get all excited and everything, and he responds to that. So the first point here that we're going to cover is have the, the ultimate access that we have to the Father. Verse 26, we're told, in that day you ask, uh, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you. So let me read it again, the last part. To, I, I, I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you. It appears up to this point, they were depending upon Jesus to pray to the Father for the things that they needed, and I'm, he was very glad to do that. But what he's trying to say and, and accomplish is helping them understand that you don't you don't have to depend on me to pray for you anymore, and, and that won't be necessary. And he says, notice he says, in my name, verse 26, in my name. And that, that isn't merely just saying in Jesus' name in your prayer. It's talking about when you're praying in line with who he is, his character, his word, his, you know, all those things you learn over time. So he's always qualifying in him. That's when we pray in Jesus' name. I'm not saying it's wrong to say in Jesus' name, of course. We, we say it. But it's more than that, for sure. 
And so it's, it's, it's in line with his character, his nature, his word. That's the key. And the thing that I really want to focus on briefly is that we don't need a mediator anymore. And remember, their world is they have the whole priesthood, the whole Jewish priest, priesthood that they were you know, engaged in and believed in, all, all those things. And when Jesus, so when Jesus died on the cross, he's on the cross from 9 a.m. to around 3 p.m., there was darkness from noon to th- around 3 p.m. And we're told in Scripture that the temple veil was torn from top to bottom, and that separated the ho- most holy place from the holy place. So the most holy place, only the high priest could go in once a year. And that after he had sacrifices um, made for his own sin. So it was rent or ripped from top to bottom, I believe, to communicate that God is causing you, be- because of what Jesus did on the cross, access. That's the key word. And so he's telling, basically what he's telling the disciples here is you have access. And no, when, I'm no doubt when they see the, when they hear about the temple being, detail, temple veil being ripped, they're going to, it's going to click access. I, you don't have to go through, see, you know, any mediator anymore, a human mediator. There's, God doesn't want any barriers between us and him. No barriers. Wants to have that intimacy with him. Paul wrote to Timothy and said in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So people, churches, traditions, all these things set up these mediators, whether it be, you know, we can just talk about Roman Catholicism, we can talk about Mary or the saints or the church or the pope or priests or whatever. There's no office of priest in the New Testament except the fact that we're, we're, there's the priesthood of all believers, that we're all priests in the sense of representing God to this world, and then we represent the world to God in the sense of intercession and prayer and, and preaching the gospel and bringing the kingdom of God that, that we take around with us everywhere we go and, and, and have the Lord invade their life through that. And, and they can experience God's uh, heart through our lives. So he's saying you can go directly to the Father. You don't have to go through anyone else. What a privilege that is. No pastor, no, no one. You don't have to go through any person. I remember as a kid, and I'm not trying to pick on Roman Catholicism. There's people that know the Lord in Roman Catholicism. But I had to do that confession. Uh, you know, we were confessing to the priest. And I'm like, I don't want to tell him the truth. You know, I don't know if he can handle, you know, I stole some Pop-Tarts you know, out of my friend's lunchbox or whatever it is. I've had a, a long relationship with Pop-Tarts, unfortunately. But, but I would just make stuff up. I would just make stuff up. And, and I realized the, the more creative I got, the more, the more prayers he told me to pray, and I wasn't helping myself. And then if I tried to be quiet and say I didn't, there's nothing, then he would, I would be guilty there too. So I'm like, how do I win this thing? But the fact is, I, I love the fact that God makes it clear we can go directly to God as long as we are, we're in Christ. Once we're in Christ, we can go directly to him. No middlemen. He wants to be as close as possible. What if you're, you, you're, uh, you know, your child had to go through the butler, if you had a butler? I'm dating myself, but I remember Benson. Okay, okay. It's reruns if you don't know that show. But if you, you know, they had to go through a butler to get to you. That would break your heart. You like no, I want I want to be as close to you as I possibly can. So he says you have access, you can pray, and he gets into the this is my second point, the reason for that access in verse 27. Verse 27, we're told, For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. So it's emphatic. The Father Himself, He's stressing it, He's emphasizing it. The Father Himself loves you. Now, this, these, both these words here in this verse, loves and loved, are not agape that we would expect. It's phileo, and it's, not, it, it's just a different kind of love. It's a brotherly love. The city of Philadelphia has phileo in it, the city of brotherly love. And, and it's not just about, you know, Philadelphia. I'm actually going to go there, Lord willing, next month for my 30th anniversary, and I'm excited about it, but I want to see how much brotherly love is going on there because they're named after that. And at Calvary Chapel, Philadelphia, which we'll be able to visit, hopefully, uh, you know, he always talks about that 
the pastor there always talks about that they're the church of brotherly love and we have to live up to our name and what a burden you know i'm glad what's half moon bay mean in the original pig lot and i don't know but maybe there's some deeper meaning that we have to live up to uh like like they do so the question we have to ask though is why does god love us and the reason why god loves us primarily is that god is love and there's kind of some teachings out there where it says you're so lovable it doesn't say that we're so lovable that God just can't resist. It doesn't say that. He, it's because he is love. He loves us because that's who he is. Let me use a double negative for you English teachers so I can make sure you're paying attention. He cannot not love us because he is God and he is love. But also with this verse, we're told it's because we love Jesus and because we believed he came forth from God. The challenge for most of us, and maybe that's you, here or listening online or watching online, you struggle with the love of God to believe that God loves you, to struggle. And no one can make that happen. You have to accept what Jesus says and what God says in his word about you. And you can say, well, you know, God so loved the world and, you know, it's, I'm like a part of a larger whole. Like it's each person, individually, he loves as if you were the only one. And the fact that he came and sent his son for us to die in our place forever settles it. It should you know, forever settle it. We can't focus on our failures and think that he doesn't love us because he already knew our failures from eternity past. And on the cross, he died for all of our failures. In fact, he's so familiar with our failures, he died for sins we haven't even committed yet. Just take a walk with that and think about that. He knows your failures more than you because he died for them. So I know if you're struggling, it could be hard to believe that, and it's a step-by-step, by-faith process of just believing it, even though you don't understand it. He never asks us to understand to the extent to which he loved us. He just says, I love you. And there's so many things in Scripture he says about us that we would never believe apart from him saying, but it's prideful to reject those things and to, and to say, I, I have a, my assessment is more accurate than an all-knowing, all-loving God that died in my place. We can't elevate that. So that's the encouragement. If you're here today, I want to encourage you. Accept God's love because God proved it. He demonstrated that for you. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and 15, the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus, that if one died, meaning Jesus, for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live uh, should live no longer for themselves. That's a bummer for self-help churches right there. Uh, but, for, but for him who died for them and rose again. So we should not live for ourselves anymore. Self is the problem. That's the problem. And that's why we have to die to ourself, to take up our cross daily and follow him. There's no shortcuts. The, the, the biggest problem that we have is, is our flesh, and the flesh needs to be crucified on a daily basis. Now, here's the so-called, in verse 28, the so-called, you're speaking to us plainly. And, and like now we, we get it. You know, it's a, I came forth from the Father, verse 28, and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. So he did. He didn't use any figurative language. He said it plainly. Came from the Father, have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go into the Father. No metaphors, no figurative speech, just speaking directly. Where he pre-existed, he came, he died, and he's about to go back to the Father. I don't know how much of this stuck with them when they were scattered. I don't know how much they thought back. You know, chapters 14 through 16 that we've been looking at in this upper room, that, how long would it sit, take to say all those things? 30 minutes, an hour. If you were just to say those things, you could time it. I should have done that, but I you know, can't always prepare the way you want. But try it. Just read through those things as if you're sharing them, not just, re- you know, just saying them as fast as you can. But just it wasn't that long. So he's looking to, to encourage them, and, he, and, he's, and he's wanting them to understand that this I've done for you because I, I love you, and I want you to be prepared. He took on human flesh. We saw in John chapter 1, verse 14, way back when we started, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. If you're here today and you 
have not experienced the grace of God yet. Grace just means undeserved favor. And, and f- the false teaching comes in when it's, when it's all about me doing something to get God to think about me a certain way or accept me or love me or all these man-made rules. And usually man-made rules are always coupled with harshness and strictness and not showing the love of the Father. And, and if you've experienced that, there's healing that God wants to bring in your life. But Jesus is absolutely full of grace and truth. And, and we need grace and truth every single day. I know I do. Now look at the response in verses 29 and 30. His disciples said to him, See, now you are speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this we believe that you came forth from God. So yes, figurative language. You know, he wasn't using it. He spoke clearly. But again, I think he's thinking of something else. And he's talking about in that day, in that time. It's going to be a time where he's, he's going to be with them for 40 days off and on, after, subsequent to the resurrection. And then he's going to be, then he's going to ascend. So he's going to have all of this way to be able to directly communicate with them. They're going to be different. Remember, they don't have the Holy Spirit in them at this point. That's not going to happen for three more chapters in chapter 20 when he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. So there's so much that's going to be illuminated. So remember, there's different times in Scripture we see even in the book of John, like in John chapter 2, verses 19 through 21, where you know, he talks about, destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. You know, and then they realize later, the disciples, what he was, that he was talking about his body. There's a, lot, there's a handful of times in the New Testament where you see that they, they had that aha moment and the light went on subsequent to the resurrection. So that's what he's getting at. Then he answered in verse 31, Jesus answered, do you now believe? And the, and the inference from the language is just now. Do you just now believe? Do you just now? Really? You know, I don't know what, he's probably like, I'm not even going to deal with that right now. I have more important things to deal with. But he says in verse 32, indeed, the hour is coming. Yes, has now come that you will be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. So yes, now the time has come. It's coming and it's arrived. It's here. I mean, just in a very short time, he's going to be arrested. And he says, you will be scattered. That's passive. The construction there, it's passive. So it's the situation, whatever it is, is going to cause them to leave and be scattered. The thing that they're more culpable regarding is when he says, each to his own and will leave me alone. Leave me alone. That was something that probably has more of culpability or, you know, where there's fault, sincere fault uh, there. Because we're only, you know, John and Peter, they went to the court, court area uh, of the, uh, the outer courts or whatever of, of, the, of the high priest. And then we see John at the cross, but we really don't see any of the disciples, the other nine, with him or, you know, he says you're going to go and be with your own. But they, so they were thinking about this and they were contemplating this and it, they chose to stay away. And, and, and so he says, you will be scattered. You're going to go on your own. And he says, you know, but I'm not really alone. And I, and I think that it's very possible. He's gracious for even saying this, doesn't have to, because they would remember that he said that later, you know, we, we left him, but he said he's not, he's not alone completely because he's with the Father. And so I think that Jesus here knew he was, uh, that, that it was going to hurt them more than it was going to hurt him. The fact that they were left him alone. So I think that's searching to think about. And again, I had mentioned before that it's very possible that we can talk to them. You know, we will be able to talk to them and ask them what was going through their minds, you know, all these things. I mean, Peter's going to deny him three times, just that he's already told Peter that's going to happen. They're all, oh, they're going to be made to stumble, but me, you know. Yeah, you're, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. You know, so again, we can get kind of prideful and we shouldn't because, you know, who knows how we would respond. Um, so it, I love the fact that he's, um, he's saying, look, I'm not ultimately alone. The Father's with me. Now, at a certain point on the cross, he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There was, and, and it's hard to understand because Jesus obviously knew the Psalms, you know, the Psalm 22, where David wrote that, not realizing it was messianic probably. 
you know, and so it wasn't like he was just saying something that, you know, is because he knew it was prophetic. And he, of course, he knows everything, but there's something about that that was a sincere question we don't understand. But we, sh- we know that it was um, the Father did that, and it was necessary because nothing bad that happened to Jesus wasn't necessary. Every single bit of it was necessary for us. Now, my third and f- final point um, is that we have peace because Jesus overcame the world. Look at verse 33. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace, in the world you, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. I've, I, I believe that Jesus here is this whole thing that he's talking about when it says these things I have spoken to you, I believe it goes all the way back to the beginning of the upper room discourse. All these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. That was his purpose for all of it, to help them, to be there for him. He was ministering to them. You remember, he, after Lazarus was raised from the dead, as we saw, that was pretty much it. And then, and then he was focused, and half of this book has been the, from that point on. Um, the, the last week of Jesus' life constitutes uh, more than half of the book of John. And these things we don't get in the synoptic gospels, uh, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So he says there's a contrast here. I want you to, did you see that it says, in me and then in the world? I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace, and in, in the world you will have tribulation. So he's contrasting the world with what's in him. Again, it has to be in him. We have to be in Christ. We have to be positionally righteous before him, which happens when we're born again. We're positionally deemed, now we don't deserve it, but deemed righteous. And positionally, we're perfect before God. Practically speaking, we fall short every day. But our legal kind of standing with God is that we're in Christ. And so he contrasts that. But again, the world has no peace to offer, nothing that's valuable anyway. And he wants them to have his peace. I honestly, and this isn't, if you're here today and you're not a believer, this isn't like intended to belittle or look down anyone's nose specifically mine since I'm talking. Uh, but I don't know how people, unbelievers, handle this world. I really don't. I mean, it's so bad out there. It's so horrible. Uh, and, and we all need God's peace so much. We need it. And, and, and that's where if they would just come how Jesus says to come, instead of how they assume that they should come to him, he would forgive them and give them peace. It's a free gift. You, don't, you can't earn it. You can't ever deserve it. You can't ever do anything to get God to do it. It's just there as a gift just to receive. And then he comes in and he, he, he puts our house in order in a sense of our lives. So we deal with the things that unbelievers do, but we deal with the flesh, the devil, and the ways of this world. And I, I communicate with new believers. I try to help them understand because there's this current you know, you're going downstream before you're born again. You don't really feel a current. But once you do that U-turn and you start trying to go the other direction and you're trying to fight your sinful nature that you can't escape from, uh, you know, and, and the ways of this world and the demonic attacks and all these things, you're like, wow, this is a current. This is, I didn't realize the current existed. Well, that's because you were going downstream with the current. Jesus said, broad is the road that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to life, and few find it. Few find it. But the thing with us is that what God compensates with is his amazing heavenly resources for the believer, his Holy Spirit, his word, his church, his power. He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He's given us the Holy Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. What can separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing. I don't have to go through the long list because it's basically the first question is rhetorical. It means nothing can separate us from his love. Even if we try, we try to run and we we make an an effort, we can't outrun his love. He's always trying to reach us, which means that we should never give up on anybody. We should always be reaching out. We should always be preaching the gospel and encouraging people and and. And to go out and find the lost sheep and bring them back into the fold. That's God's heart. So we have to be of good cheer, he says. And really what he's saying is, take heart. 
That's what he's saying. Take heart. He goes, I have overcome the world. He hadn't even gone to the cross yet. He hasn't even been arrested. And he had overcome the world. What does that mean? It means that he had lived according to how he should live as coming with his mission. And nothing got in the way of that. He never sinned. He never... No one can conv- uh, ex- um, convict him of sin. He said that. Who among you convicts me of sin? And there was silence then and there's silence today. There's nobody that could, could ever accuse him of anything. The thing is, when you're stumbled with people that claim to know God, and not everyone knows God that claims to know God. We don't card you in here. Card you? So we had somehow like, you have a salvation card? I need to, I need to see your credentials. Or you're going to get bounced out of here. You know, we don't know who's in here. And this is a hospital. There's un- unbelievers here. There's believers here. There's make-believers here. There's all different kind of categories. I, me- I remember uh, J. Vernon McGee, <laughs> the teaching the Bible, and he was talking about the mixed multitude, you know, and how the mixed multitude in Egypt, they came along, they came along with, the, with the Israelites there. And he was saying, there's always the, these make-believers, you know, and he was saying, you know, some of my board are make-believers, <laughs> you know, I'm like, whoa, that's on the radio. Uh, but, you know, the point is, is that we don't know people's hearts. We don't know. We don't know. And so we always have to be patient. This is a hospital. Uh, this is a place where they, the wounded get hurt, get, get cared for. We can't have an environment where we're actors. That's what the word hypocrite means. It means an actor. The old Grecian uh, actors were called hypocrites because they wore a mask. And, and, and being a hypocrite is not mess, messing up and making mistakes. Being a hypocrite is acting like you have it all together when you don't. But you have to have an environment where it's, people are gracious and loving and supporting. And I'm so thankful that our family here is like that. I mean, we're growing, we're all growing, but we have to be gracious. So he had already come, overcome the world. And because he overcame the world, we can overcome the world uh, because of what he accomplished on the cross. The important thing to understand is that we're not fighting for victory, we're fighting from victory. Again, not original, but it's true. We have the victory. Right now, we have the victory. But do we live according to that victory? That's what we're all growing in. The, the Bible paints this picture of us ha- being completely victorious, that no, we're more than conquerors. I'd be thankful to be called a, a conqueror. And it's not like, well, let me see how you do, and I'll figure out if I'm going to call you a conqueror. No, it's we're more than that conquerors. Even more, than, that's what he's saying who we are. So we're, we're working from his Victory. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. This is his church. And there's nothing that the enemy can defend against. That's what it means. Gates were defensive mechanisms of a city. He's talking about there's nothing, the the Hades cannot withstand the onslaught or the offensive of the church moving forward. And this is what we do. We think about the church is in the whole world is like how it is here and Europe. Such a mistake. God's pouring out His Spirit, first of all, here in a lot, in huge ways that we haven't seen in a long time. But of course, you're not going to see that. Uh, the world's not going to report that. But then you look at other countries like South America and Africa and China, Iran. I, Iran is having major m- amounts of people becoming Christians. China has more Christians than here. So yes, the gospel needs to go out. Way, way more people need to be saved. Of course, we know that. But Christianity is doing well around the world. And we can't project how we think it is in our little you know, spheres of influence and think that's how it is in the whole body. It's not. And we allow the, that, the skepticism, we allow the unbelief to, to quench the spirit in us. We do. And God doesn't want that to happen. He wants us to be energized and strengthened and encouraged and looking at his word as the final uh, motivator for us. The Holy Spirit motivates us. I can't motivate people. I trust the Holy Spirit keeps everybody motivated. You think I can, even with the church of our size, there's no way I can provide the motivation if the Holy Spirit isn't doing it directly. I just want to tell us and remind us, we were made to overcome. It's in our spiritual DNA to overcome. In Revelation, we're told that they overcame by, the, by the, the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. They overcame. We sang about it already. John would later write in his first epistle in 1 John 5, 4, 
For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. See, that's why he said, because you, you, the, you can come to God. You can pray all these requests. I don't have to pray for you anymore because the Father loves you, and he loves you because you love me, and you accepted me as the Messiah coming into the world. That, that requires faith. And, and, and so I always try to encourage people, don't be strong. Be dependent. He calls us to be strong in the Lord and, and not in ourselves to be dependent upon him. He doesn't call us to be strong in ourselves. He calls us to be dependent upon him. And then that's when his strength is made perfect in weakness. That's what he said to the apostle Paul when he had the thorn of the flesh that he prayed multiple times to have that removed. So he says, I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer. Take heart. Who's discouraged here today? God wants to lift your head and encourage you. He wants, to, he wants to pour into you his perspective. That's why we need this every day. We have, even if we didn't, weren't being bombarded with all these ungodly things that are unbiblical and sinful, but we're bombarded by all these things that are against what this says, against what this clearly says, that man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We need to live and feed on him spiritually every day. If, if, that's the first thing we ask in counseling appointments. I don't ask, do you have a devotional life? I ask, tell me about your devotional life because the expectation is that you would have it. And, and I want to know the specifics of it. I want to know how maybe I can help you and encourage you to go deeper. In, in, you know, I'm talking to me too. Well, you can go deeper to, to, to really connect with the Lord every single day. And Jesus said, go into, in secret. Go into that prayer closet in secret and pray, and, and, and what you do in secret, God will reward you openly, and he will bless you. And so that's the key. We're going to harp on that forever, because there's, it's, that's, that's why he saved you, is to know you and have a relationship with you. He want, it's not about being religious and going to church and all these things. That has its place. God knows that we grow through that, and we bless other people and help them grow through that. But it's much more than, than a building. It's much more than a Sunday. It's a living relationship with him, letting him pour out his Holy Spirit upon your life and in your life and through your life. It's so beautiful. Don't get caught up on organized religion. People always talk about that. Well, come here. You'll see disorganized religion. I'm just kidding. We're working on it. But, but the point is, is that we just have to be so gracious and loving and just go to God and let him pour into our spirits. And because he didn't just save us for our own benefit. I know that it's, we can forget that. He saved us for, for his benefit and for the people that we would touch and the lives that we would be able to uh, impact with him working through our lives. That's why he saved us, to bring him glory, of course, first and foremost, but he wants us to be about other people, others. I love the, I love the, the, the bumper sticker that just says others. Have you seen that? Gail Irwin, the Bible teacher, had that for a long time. I think you can still get him. It just says others on the back. Now, you can't drive like a maniac and have that on, uh, you know, on the back of your car because you're like, does he mean he's going to hit others? Is he, what does that mean? You know, we have to be careful. But, um, and by the way, you can't drive faster than your guardian angel. Your guardian angel only goes as fast as the speed limit. And then, he, then they kind of go, let you keep going. You have to, I'm just kidding, but we kind of drive like crazy sometimes. It's, a, it's, it's incredible. So God wants to encourage us. Um, if there's anyone here, I would like to pray for you real quick. If, you're, if you need prayer regarding God, the, you know, needing more peace, needing God to come into your life, just raise your hand right now. And um, one, two, okay, a handful, great. Let's, let's, let's stand real quick, and let's just raise your hand if that's you, and, and just come around them and just pray for them, just minister to them. And, and we'll just take a few minutes to do that. Just, just come to them, lay hands on them, pray for them, and we'll just minister to each other just for a few minutes. Let's do that now. Lord, I pray for those that stood. I pray, Lord, that you would just bring forth your supernatural peace, Lord. I pray that you'd pour out your Holy Spirit upon them right now. They've been, they were brave enough to raise their hand, Lord. And so I pray that you would just overwhelm them with your joy and your peace, Lord, and, and calm them. Lord, I pray that you would sense your presence, Lord, in a special way as 
they're being prayed for, Lord. And I just pray that you would encourage them. I pray, Lord, that they would have their focus on you. Lord, and I just thank you that your body is so good at caring for us. Thank you that you have the church for us. We're so grateful for how you work through your church and your body. And thank you that you so closely associate with us uh, that you call us your body. And we're so thankful for that, Lord. So I just pray, Lord, that you would um, bless these people that need that encouragement. Lord, and I pray if anyone needs that encouragement, didn't raise their hand, that you would minister to them. And, and we thank you for how you've already ministered to them, Lord, through your word today. I thank you that you meet with us. I thank you that you bless your word. I thank you for all that you're doing in our lives, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.